as I was saying, the condition of hydrostatic equilibrium in a fluid is that for every interval dy that you go deeper down, and this coordinate system, that means y becoming smaller, because this coordinate system is sort of the normal one you're used to, where y starts at zero at the bottom and goes up. It's the opposite of depth, which is what I was using before, so that we're going to have a minus sign in here. Aside from that, for each interval that you go deeper down in the fluid, there's an extra fluid element weighting down on top of you, which has to be balanced by higher pressure. And the amount of additional fluid that was included in this little cylinder here is dy times a times, that's the volume, times the density rho. And so the additional pressure is going to be that times g. And that formula is encapsulated in this very simple differential equation the gradient or vertical change in pressure as you change your height sorry this is y actually that's why there's a minus sign is minus rho times g the minus is simply because of the way we define the coordinate system here this is defined with y increasing as you go up or as you realize h increases as y gets smaller that's for the minus sign so there's your uh, hydrostatic equilibrium condition and since we're going to only deal with problems where rho is a constant here and g is a constant, this one is going to be pretty easy to solve. Actually, we could uh, do a simple integral with that equation. Let's see if we can do that now. And I'll go to the next slide. All right, here is the solution that you would get. Remember, if dp dy is equal to minus rho g, I could multiply both sides by dy and then I have a very simple integral on this side. Just give me the starting point where you're measuring the pressure and the finishing point where you're measuring the pressure. That corresponds to a certain starting y-coordinate or depth, a certain ending y-coordinate, y1 and y2, and then the change, this is what hydrostatic equilibrium was saying, the hydro HSE, in case you don't know what that means and you like acronyms, it sounds so cool. The HSE says that the change in P from P1 to P2 is the integral from Y1 to Y2 of rho G dy. Very simple. The equation's going to get just a little bit more complicated now if I want to calculate, for example, a force over an uh, object uh, that has an extent, a significant vertical uh, dimension to it, like for example a window on an aquarium. So that's the only non-trivial example I can think of where we could apply this HSE formula here. So let's look at that problem. There we have it. We've got, uh, this looks like a very boring aquarium, one fish in it. I don't think anybody's going to want to go visit there. But anyway, you know, if I had a really fancy office instead of the mess that I have behind me here, I would probably install a big aquarium like this. Now, this is an interesting aquarium because the window only starts, the top of the window is right there, it starts one meter below the water surface of this tank, and then it goes down to a depth of two meters here just to make it a slightly non-trivial problem. And again, to make it slightly non-trivial, I've decided I'm going to keep a simple rectangle here for the window, but it's three meters in width. So, of course, right now with your formula, you could tell me exactly what the pressure is at any location on the window. For example, um, at the top here along uh, the upper boundary of the window, there's definite pressure on it. What's the pressure? Hello, rho g h. So what would that be? Rho is a thousand, g is ten, h in this case is one meter. We're already under one meter of water, and you might be thinking, oh well, this window is sideways. I thought that pressure's down. No, 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 no. You're thinking about solids and your six a experience. Remember, the pressure goes in all directions, including it's bursting and pushing right outside this window. So there is a substantial amount of pressure down there on every square meter of the window along here, every square inch uh, of it is under pressure. 
And of course, all of these pieces of the window here are at the same depth, so they all have the same pressure. No problem with that. Here's where things get a little bit interesting, though. If I have to calculate the force on this entire window, I need to account for the increase in the pressure as I go down the window here. So for example, at the bottom of the window, what's the depth? It's twice the top of the window. So the pressure along the bottom of the window, that's the part you'd have to worry about blowing out first. If you don't have a thick enough window that's set solidly into the wall here, because this is at two meters depth and so it has twice the pressure. The water pressure down here, rho g h, is twice the pressure that it is at the top of the window. Now what's the total force on the window? Well you have to just add up the force of each vertical layer of the window starting from smaller uh, forces on these rows then there's a bigger one, bigger one, bigger one, bigger one, bigger one. We add them all up until we add the final dy which is the last uh, bottom section of the window going down to two meters depth. It's a simple integral. I totally know everybody can do this integral no problem in this class. Let's set it up then. What I want to figure out the force on the entire window is to add layers of the window glass one at a time, horizontal layers, and then integrate it up. I guess I could start from here and integrate down to here. That would be fine. Start from y1 equals one meter down and go to y2 two meters down. So let's try that. There's, I'm just laying it all out for you instead of writing this by hand. Uh, so the piece of additional force that's provided by this one layer that's dy thick on the glass here, I'm going to have to add up all these forces on the window, it's one solid piece of glass, is the pressure at that location. So I said to say explicitly the pressure is a function of y here. In fact, it's going up now I'm sorry to switch this around. I decided, because I was lazy, it's intuitive, I decided to go back to defining y as a depth. So I have now reversed the direction of y from the previous slide where I had the HSE, and so then I had to change the minus sign and take it out of here. So if you define y as the depth from the top of the water surface, which is a pretty, I think that's a good way to do it when you're working problems on this, then the minus sign goes away. Right? The pressure starts out at zero, right here at the very tippy top of the water and just goes up and up and up as y gets deeper and deeper and deeper. There's your rho gy formula. That's your pressure. Then I just need to add up the area. Ah, but the area also uh, has a, a dy in it, right? The area of this, you have a cross, its length is the three meters wide and the height is dy. So the area of that piece, the differential area dA is three dy. So then you can see that this ought to be pretty easy. Integrate both sides here. So I'll get the total force is going to be the integral of this from y1 to y2, which is the integral of this from y1 to y2. Well, we have constants that come out in front. 3 is a constant, g is a constant, rho is a constant. We're not uh, letting the water get compressed. It's a constant density of water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So let's pull all of that stuff outside of the integral. Then I have a very, very simple integral, which I promised all of you could do. It's the integral uh, from y1 to y2 of what? y dy. Come on, everybody can do that integral. The integral of y dy, of course, is just y squared over 2. How simple is that? Evaluated from y1 to y2. In other words, evaluated from one meter going down to two meters. All right, so let's do the constants first. That's easy. Three is three. Rho is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. G is 10 meters per second squared. Then this formula here, well, y1 is one meter. One squared is still one. One half. That's what's at the bottom. At the top, we're two meters down. We have y squared is two squared is four. So we have four halves minus one half is three halves here. So that's what the integral gives you in square meters. And so you multiply all these things together and you get 45,000 newtons. Wow, that's a pretty large force. You want to have a pretty strong, thick piece of glass that's wedged in there very tightly to withstand a 45,000 newton force. All right, if you put in the exact number uh, for the gravitational acceleration, g is 9.8, this comes out to 44,000. I'll give you full credit for either answer, because you know, for me, g is just 10.
All right, so that's how you would solve a non-trivial problem using hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, there are a lot of uh, useful situations where the properties of fluids in hydrostatic equilibrium can do great things for you that you would not otherwise have thought. Classic uh, example I can think of, let's leave the aquarium now and go to the auto body shop. And uh, the first thing you want to do is figure out, is there a way that I could jack up a uh, lift an entire automobile? That would take an enormous amount of force because the mass of the automobile is huge. So mg, which is the force it would be required to hold this thing up or lift it up, will be enormous. And I'm just, you know, not a very strong guy. I can't exert that kind of force um, on anything. Can I get a mechanical advantage using Pascal's principle, using the laws of hydrostatic equilibrium and fluid mechanics? Yes, I can. This is how hydraulic lifts and I believe also how hydraulic brakes work. If we apply a moderate force, something that a human could do, to a very small area, then that would correspond to putting a lot of pressure on a small area. This is something a human could do without a, a machine helping you out or some engine to do this. So in the case of the auto shop, I need a rather small cross-sectional area here, like a little thin tube or something, with a fluid. Let's just say it's water. It might be some other kind of fluid, but it looks like it's pink fluid in this case. And so I'm going to exert a force on here. The area is small, so the pressure, of course, is the force that I can exert divided by A. Hopefully, it's a fairly big pressure. And now here's the magic of fluids. That force or that pressure is the same in all directions. So it's transmitted everywhere. In particular, it's transmitted over to this push plate here. This push plate, which is uh, going to lift up the car, has a very large area. You'll notice that this area is much bigger, uh, the area that wants to hold up the car, compared to the area that I was pushing on. And we have the wonderful formula here. What's the relation between the pressure where I'm pushing, trying to exert some extra pressure on there, compared to the pressure of this plate? You got it. They're equal. Same pressures. So then what's the force? If I exert a little force here as indicated by the pink arrow down, now the force has turned around completely. It's gone around 180 degrees around because the fluid pushes wherever it can. It's going to push up here, except now the force you can see is multiplied by how much? The force, because the pressures are equal, P out equals P in. Therefore, F out divided by A out equals F in divided by A in. In other words, F out is my initial force that I was pushing on multiplied by the ratio A out over A in. And if I can make this big, then I can get a big force multiplier. Yay! It's kind of like having a lever or a pulley, a little scrawny guy like me with almost no muscles at all, able in principle, looks like I could lift a car this way. How cool would that be? I think I could, this will work the same way that if you gave me a lever, like you use maybe in Physics 6a examples. Remember that uh, great quote by that famous Greek guy, you know, if you give me a lever that's long enough, I could lift the entire world. True, yeah, if you had, and you need to pivot, and you need to stand somewhere, whatever. Anyway, you give me uh, a large enough expansion from A out over A in, then I can lift a car. Because I can, I can push down with maybe a few, a hundred, a few hundred pounds of, of force, something like that, maybe a hundred pounds of force, and I can multiply that into thousands of pounds if I make A out to be large. And some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, that seems kind of magical. That's like a mysterious uh, cheat here. Aren't we violating, you know, some conservation of energy here? I mean, I push down here with a small force. I'm doing you know, a little bit of work. Seems like we're getting a huge force out here. But look, wait a minute, there's no way we can put in less work here and get more work out here. The amount of work done by me pushing down has to be equal to the amount of work done lifting up this car, doesn't it? Yes, you're quite right. The work has to be the same and this is the same problem you have with pulleys, for example. Remember, you have this, this uh, wimpy guy 
kind of uh, lifting, you know, thousand pound piano or something with a pulley and he's only exerting maybe, you know, 150 pounds of force or something. That's right. But the work, you have to think about it, is not just F. The work is the integral of F dx or, or dy, I should say. The work is the force times the distance that you've moved the object. So I'm putting in a small force here. I'm going to need a very big distance. I'm going to have to push this plunger down a long way because this plunger is only going to move up a very short distance. And that, I think, is rather misleading about this diagram. doesn't really show you that at all. I'm going to have to push, the, you can sort of see it, I'm going to have to push this thing down many feet, probably, just to get this car to go up, I don't know, several inches. So anyway, actually, I probably would do this with a little motor. But thank goodness I don't need a very high power motor because I have this force multiplier that's helping me out here. So that is a nice practical example of how this would work. We'll look at that next.